Mantle Ministries presents Richard Little Bear Wheeler. Come join Little Bear in true adventures of the past and discover biblical principles that can change your life. Greetings, pilgrims, patriots, and friends again. Welcome back to the Mountain Men. In the series that we're going through, there's much to learn about the mountain men. To be a good mountain man, there was many a skill that they had to learn. In this episode, I want to show you how they shot their muzzle-loading rifles. Let me use this for an example. This is called a percussion lock. To be exact, it's called a Hawkins rifle. The Hawkins were two brothers that designed a rifle that was a little shorter than the Kentucky long rifle. They figured as they moved out west, they'd need a shorter rifle, one they could carry in a scabbard alongside the horse and whip it out to shoot buffalo, or Indians, or hunting. And so the rifle was developed, a shorter version of the old muzzleloaders back from the uh, days of the, the colonists. And so what we have here is called a percussion lock. The percussion lock came after the flint lock, and the reason why it's called a lock is this part here is the lock of the musket. And when you pull the hammer back, you have a little tiny nipple, kind of like a baby bottle, has a single hole in it. So it gets a percussion lock action. The word percussion comes because this hammer hits the nipple quite hard, like a drumstick hitting a drum, getting the percussion instrument. So this is the percussion lock. Now, back in about uh, 1812 or so, a man by the name of Joshua Shaw was inventing an itsy bitsy teeny weeny little thing called a primer cap. And that primer cap was essential for these locks. The idea was to put the primer cap on the nipple. Now I'm going to shoot a pistol in just a moment, but before I put the musket down, or muzzle loader would be another term for it. And reason being is that you load from the, from the muzzle, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But before that I want to show you these two set triggers. Uh, they're, they're not, they don't both shoot, the back one sets the front one. So when you pull the hammer back, like this, you pull the back trigger, or squeeze the back trigger, it sets the front trigger, making the front trigger a hair trigger. So that when you barely squeeze the hammer trigger down, it goes off without shaking the musket. There's a little screw there called a set screw. So you're able to adjust the tension on the front trigger as how it squeezes and pulls. So you get just the way that you like to shoot it. And on these, they want it as accurate as they can uh, for shooting long distances. These early muskets were also rifled, barreled. So it made them a lot more accurate than the colonial muskets that were used by the Continental soldiers during the War for Independence. Now I'm going to put this one down and to shoot a pistol, it's a lot easier to handle. And for the sake of cameras and, and such, it makes it easier to display and, and demonstrate. Everything else is, is called the same. This is called a percussion lock, muzzle loading pistol. This is the lock. The hammer goes down, cause, calling it percussion. The muzzle loader, because you load it from the muzzle. Now let me go through the stages. You take the little primer cap in your hand, you pull the hammer back, you put the, the cap on the nipple, and I always put the hammer down by squeezing the trigger and gently lowering the hammer onto the cap. The next is you put the powder in. Now mountain men carried powder oftentimes in a powder horn. And uh, a lot of times you might see a movie where they pour directly into their muzzle. That's very dangerous. Because if you happen to have a hot spark in there, it can blow your entire powder horn up in your hand. So many of them poured the right amount of powder into their hand and then down into the muzzle. Some of these things that I have on my belt, you've been wondering, uh, these are powder measures. It gives me exact powder measure that I need, 70 grains of black powder. And so I can uh, pre-measure my load. Now with a pistol, you don't need quite 70 grains, but I will use my powder measure that I pre-measured. Too much powder can blow the gun up, the rifle or the gun, a too little powder can make the ball go out but not sufficient speed or with strength to down the animal that you're shooting. So they had to have just the right amount of powder. So I will pour the powder down the muzzle. Just like that. Then 
The next process was putting the wad and the ball on top of the charge. Now a wad could be either paper or cloth. They were both used. And uh, the idea of the wad is without the wad, the ball is, sits on the powder and when it explodes, the, the, the pressure comes around the ball edge and therefore the ball doesn't come out with the velocity, velocity needed. So it's important to have wadding uh, with your charges. I suppose in an emergency you could shoot them without, but uh, it was very important to have that. So the idea of the wad, you would just take arbitrarily a, a piece of cloth or paper and sit it on there. It didn't have to be any shape or size. You would take your ball, lay it on the muzzle, and then you would take what's called a starter block. Now I'm not going to shoot a lead ball just for safety reasons, but you would take the starter block and you'd set it right down on the ball and with your fist you would pop that ball down the barrel the length of your starter rod. Then you would take the other end of the rod and you would set it in and then push the ball further down. Now you're saying, well, Little Bear, why do you have to do all that? It, it, I've never seen that done before in movies. Well, movies bypass a lot of these stages that are important. Now what would happen is if you didn't bring that starter rod down far enough, when you took your little ramrod in there, if you're trying to load that down in there and push that ball, you could very easily snap and break your ramrod. Well, without the ramrod, you're not, in, you're not gonna get a shot. And if you break your ramrod, you're in trouble. So you must do these, these processes. Uh, by the way, one time Kit Carson, he left his ramrod inside the, the muzzle like that and he forgot and he shot it. And you know what that did, it sent his ramrod away like an arrow. And, uh, and once you lose that, you might as well quit shooting or make yourself a ramrod. They didn't have J.C. Penney's Sears Awards to go buy anything either, they made their things. Then the next thing, the ball is now uh, uh, halfway down, you take your ramrod, drop it on top of the ball, and you'll, it'll stop. Then with two hands, you, you bring the, the ramrod down all the way till it stops, which means the ball is now seated on the powder. Now for the sake of this, I would just take a piece of wad without the lead ball, and I'll put the wad in there. And then what that's going to do is going to keep my powder from flying out of the muzzle uh, when I go to shoot it. Otherwise, what would happen is if I happen to turn the muzzle like this, I'd lose my powder. So I will keep my wad in there, pack it down, then I will pull back the hammer and we'll discharge this. Before I shoot, I must say something. Sometimes young people watch these things and they want to go and try it. I must give you a safety tip here. These are shot with black powder only, which can only be bought in certain stores. Not any bullet powder will work. There was a boy that took a bullet uh, and, and took the powder out of it. Well, it was uh, actually shotgun shells. He took the powder out of three shotgun shells. He didn't know where to get powder. He didn't know the difference between smokeless modern black, uh, excuse me, smokeless powder and black powder. And he took smokeless powder, more powerful than black powder, put it in the muzzle of a Harper Ferry's rifle that he picked up. He was afraid it might blow up. He wasn't sure. He was just a young man, 16, I believe. And instead of putting it to his shoulder like this to shoot that long musket, he put the butt of it against the tree, held his head back, squeezed the trigger, and it did blow up. He made a fatal mistake. You see, smokeless powder and the thin metal of a muzzle-loading musket, especially an original one, it blew the breech out, and all the skin from his index finger to his elbow was stripped off, burned up, and the piece of the metal flew through the air underneath his jaw as he had his head up and it went into his skull and it killed him three days later. So I always say this to young people because these are, these are not toys, they're very dangerous. But I, I, I would like to demonstrate because so many young people see these things and they think they're fascinating. The next thing you do is you pull the hammer back on this, smoke, on this, excuse me, on this black powder and when the hammer hits the cap it should go off. However, it may not. If it was raining, what do you think would happen? The powder on the back of the cap would be wet, so when the hammer hits it, it wouldn't go off. That's happened to me before. And things like that happened in the Old West. So these, by uh, any means, these are not more, de they're not as dependable as today, and they're also not quite as accurate. But let's see what happens on this particular case. And black powder has a lot more smoke uh, than smokeless powder, modern powder. 
And a lot of times when you go to Knott's Berry Farm and these places, they'll use black powder when they do their kind of gunfights because it makes it much more uh, exciting to see the powder in the air. And also at night you would have saw flame fly out because black powder does not burn often as clean and may, may burn and trail out like a sparkler. Now I'd like to tell you a story that should keep you on the edge of your seat. It is so exciting. True story. It involves a very famous man by the name of John Coulter. Let me tell you about John Coulter's life. John Coulter walks under the pages of history with Lewis and Clark in the very early 1800s. He's just coming back from having discovered the Pacific Ocean, going overland with Lewis and Clark all those many, many miles. On the way back, he ran into a man by the name of Manuel Lisa. Manuel Lisa took Captain Lewis and Clark aside and said, look, I want to start a beaver trading post out here in, in, in the frontier. And uh, figuring that you've been there and been back and know the area, know some of the Indian languages, possibly one of your men could serve as, as a trapper, a, a guide, a, an interpreter, and do some trading with the Indians. How about it? Who would you offer? Well, the story goes that, uh, that uh, Lewis and Clark lined up all their men, and they went through the qualifications of each man. And finally, they came to Coulter, and they stopped, and they said, you know, I think John Coulter would make a good man. He has a little bit of ability in, in language skills. He, he, he's adept on his feet. He, he's wise in his mind. He's uh, good at trapping. He's a good hunter. I think an all-around man would be none other than John Coulter. Well, Manuel Lisa approached Coulter, and Coulter thought it would be a wonderful idea. He was a young man, about 6'2", lean, and uh, he thought it would be quite adventurous to live out in the wilderness a little longer than going back to civilized life that such has happened to Lewis and Clark and all those other men. And so that started the illustrious career of John Coulter. In this true story, probably his most famous, John Coulter was out in the wilderness one day with a man by the name of Mr. Potts. Now Mr. Potts happened to be a greenhorn. A greenhorn is a, the kind of a mountain man that's just learning the basic skills and they usually pair you up with a man who'd been out in the wilderness a long time. And so John Coulter was training Mr. Potts on, on the art of uh, setting traps. And in one of these episodes uh, in the near future, I'll, I'll do a little series on, on, on uh, trap setting and, the, you know, just a little bit about traps. So they were setting their traps and, and uh, going for beaver, and he was teaching them how to skin beaver and all those things that they have to learn to make money out in the wilderness. Well, as it happened uh, that uh, they were setting traps one day, uh, a band of Blackfeet Indians swooped down on them. And uh, John Coulter, reviewing the situation, being wise and being sharp, he realized that he had no way of resisting such a large force of Indian against just the both of them. But Mr. Potts, that poor greenhorn, he was terrified, and he started to run towards the canoe to get his muzzleloader and leave. But John Coulter says, jo John Potts, don't run. Stay and surrender. Just stay. But John Potts wouldn't have none of it. He began to run, he ran to the canoe, and, and he picked up his muzzleloader to get one quick shot, and then he figured he'd canoe down the river. He forgot about John Coulter. He didn't care about him. He just wanted to save his scalp. So when he went to raise up the musket, they didn't even get it full, full lifted. He was shot full of arrows, slumped over dead in the canoe. Well, John Coulter did what he wanted to do originally. He just lifted his hands up, and that's a universal uh, sign for I surrender. So he raised his hands and surrendered, and the Indians came, and instead of killing them right on the spot, they wanted to do uh, 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 some torture. Now, I'll tell you why uh, many of the tribes tortured uh, white men and tortured their captives, and oftentimes Indians would torture other Indians. You see, the Indian and many of their religious superstitions believe that if you make a white man suffer or another Indian suffer during his death, the longer he lives, the more powerful and valiant that man is. And so they figured if, if they would suffer a long time, this great mighty warrior who suffered and lived a long time under great torture, he's a mighty man of valor. So when he dies, his spirit would come upon you, and you would have his spirit or that mighty spirit of valor upon you. And so they took John Coulter and, 
A couple of stories have it a little different. One is that they took him to the village. The other is that they had a council right then and there. But uh, I'll just take him to the village. So they took him into the village, as they often would do their captives, as some kind of a wild game, as a sport. All the children would come out and go, yeah, 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 white man. We shoot him, white man. They would tie the white man to a post. They would take their arrows, and they would shoot arrows off at this white man, little blunt arrows with no, no uh, uh, flint on the end of them, just a straight old blunt arrow. So it wouldn't kill the man, but that man would be hurt, and he'd run around. And, and, and the Indian side was a great sport, and the fathers would laugh at their little boys shooting this great game that they had brought in. And then uh, uh, they had their council deciding how they would dispose of John Coulter. And as the story goes, they tied Coulter up. Uh, he was tied at the post, and maybe I'll use this post uh, as an example. He was tied at the post, and uh, he could overhear the uh, Indians talking about how they're going to kill him. And uh, one of the Indians go, I yashanda, ataote, I shititaha, undele hetehe. And so John Coulter heard that and he goes, oh no, I, I don't want to go that way. That sounds like a terrible way to die. And uh, they were probably thinking of boiling him alive. Uh, another Indian said, Indi, ishito, ititaata. And he could overhear that one. That one said, we're going we're gonna to lift his fingernails and eat his knuckles. Now, some of these tortures that I'm giving you uh, actually were done by many uh, Indians to white captives that we uh, have record of, those that escaped to, to testify the death of their comrades. Another Indian goes, Inni, ishite, itoho, no way. Ah, no, we're going we're gonna, uh, to boil him alive. And they tried all these terrible things. Well, as it was, John Coulter, he... Uh, he found out, the chief came out, opened up the tent flap, and as the chief uh, came out, stood in front of Coulter, goes, you, white man, you run fast. Hmm, Coulter had to think, well, what do I say to that? If I tell him I run fast, they might boil me alive, lift my fingernails, or skin me alive, or do something terrible. Uh, but, but if I tell him I run slow, maybe I'll have a chance to run for my life. Well, chief, uh, I don't think I run very fast. I certainly don't run as fast as you Indians. You Indians are one of the fastest running things that have ever been made by, on this face of this earth by God. I figure you could easily outrun me. Good. We, we run after you. When we catch them, you, we cut you in little pieces. We take a knife, a tomahawk, and cut you up. We let you run for your life. John Coulter was terrified at the idea, run for my life, well, but at least it was a running chance is what he thought. And so they took his clothes off, the most embarrassing thing. Could you imagine having all your clothes taken off? No shoes, no socks, no uh, shirt, no nothing. I mean, those kids, if they were in that village, they might have been laughing at him, mocking and, and, and humorizing and all the men, women, and children out there. But I don't know if he was embarrassed, but you know what I would have been thinking about? I would have been thinking about Jesus Christ on the cross. You know, when he died, I believe they took all his clothes off. They, they, they took his outer and his inner garment off. That's about as much garment as a man wears. At least he may have had what looked like a big diaper, which would be like undershorts, but more than likely, I believe he probably had everything off, his humility. Could you imagine the crowds mocking, laughing, saying, he's a man, he's just like any other man, see there, and taunting and mocking. That's the love of Christ that he had for us on the cross. Well, John Coulter may have reflected, this might be the last chance I'll ever have to think of Christ. I might as well make peace before I die. And they lined him up at this line, and they said, go! And John Coulter began to run, barefooted, across shale rock, across that, that uh, cactus barren uh, uh, wilderness, across sagebrush, across all kinds of bark, trees, rocks, limbs, barefoot, running as fast as he could. John Coulter was an extremely good runner, lean, tall, fast on his feet. Those Indians, before long, he dusted every one of them. They walked running with moccasins on. Each of them with spears in their hands and knives, ready to catch their captive and kill him. John Coulter ran and he ran and he ran. He had a plan, I'd say up his sleeve, but he didn't have a sleeve on. But he ran and ran, and, he, and, he, and his plan was to get to the river. The river, there was three rivers, the Jefferson, the Gilton, and the Madison, all three called the Fork River, the Little Fork rivers there in Wyoming. My wife and I have been there. And his idea was to run to that river. I'll tell you what he did in just a moment. And so he's running as fast as he can towards that river. And then he can hear in the distance the patter of two feet. They were gaining on him. And he was terrified. He knew he couldn't waste a moment. It was only one Indian hot on his trail. He had to think real quickly. And as the story goes, he stopped. 
And as he stopped, the Indian plowed into him, caught him off guard. He stuck his leg and threw that Indian over. He grabbed the Indian's spear and stubbed him right through the back with that spear to the ground. He didn't know if he'd stayed long enough to kill him. He just stuck him to the ground. He began to run. He ran. He dove into the river. Being a trapper, he was looking where beaver had bunched up logs. And he began to feel around, poking his head in and out where a beaver could come in and where his shoulders and head could poke up. And sure enough, he, he worked his way underneath some logs and into a little a cavity and popped his head up. And there he was where his head broke water and he was surrounded with wood and he could breathe. Ice cold water running below him. It must have made his feet feel good. But there he's breathing. And I could just imagine maybe beaver in there. Could you imagine one beaver going, Daddy, I ain't never seen a beaver like that before. Shh, there ain't no beaver. That's a mountain man. Be quiet, boy. And so John Coulter's there, and the light's filtering down through that cavity. And then the Indians got there. Ene, ishitoto, hashita. You look over there. Itinini, mashitoto. You look here. And they were walking over the uh, logs. Some of them were breaking logs apart, figuring he might be underneath one of them beaver lodges. They were looking here and there, up and down the banks, scouring the area. Some of them was going down. Some were going upstream. Some were right where Coulter was. If you were Coulter, what would you be doing? I would pray, oh, Lord, save me. Oh, God, have mercy on me. And so those Indians ended up getting further and further away. He waited for nightfall in that cold water, and then he went down that stream. He went several miles, and then he walked out of that river, and he began a course that took him seven days. Do you know what his course was? 150 miles away. The course was Fort Lisa. Fort Lisa was the place that he wanted to run. And he not only ran, but he walked and he crawled. He hid in bushes. At night, uh, he would come out where the Indians wouldn't see him. And he'd stumble across rocks. And in the day, he'd hide underneath these bushes. Sometimes part of the day, when you was safe, he'd be walking in that sun, sunburning his back, scorching his skin, ripping off those uh, blisters uh, through that brush and bramble. His feet raw. His body uh, scratched. He was bloody from his head to his feet, uh, picking up lizards to eat along the way anthills. They would just, oftentimes I'd read accounts where mountain men just fell on an anthill and just scooped up ants as fast as they could, eating sand and ants at the same time, starved. Most of us in America have never faced that kind of starvation. And finally, he kept saying to himself, Fort Lisa, got to make it to Fort Lisa, Fort Lisa. 150 miles, seven days later, he began to stumble towards the fort, could barely walk, Looked a bloody mess, dried blood, crusted blood with scratches and sunburn. The guard post uh, sentry said, uh, Man approaching fort, open gates. And they opened the gates. They ran out as Coulter fell face down. They carried him into the barracks. And there they laid Coulter out on those barracks. And he lived to tell the story I just told you. Within three months, the man was so sound and fit, he was back out in the wilderness. He never did like Blackfeet Indian after that. I don't know why. But one thing about this story that really impresses me, again, to the scripture, because I love the scripture so much. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, a really important passage I believe we can learn spiritually from the life of John Coulter. Let me read this to you. It says, Therefore, seeing also that we are encompassed about by such a great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. You see, Coulter had a vision. It was Fort Lisa. You know, if you're a born-again Christian bought by the blood of the Lamb, you've got a vision and a purpose and a hope. And that's not only to live here and serve Christ, but it's an eternal place called heaven. You have better run in such a way where you look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The Bible says, don't be beset by sin. They stripped John Coulter's clothes off. That might have been the best thing they could have done for him. He had no encumbrance. He could run sheer-footed and fleet as fast as his feet could carry him. You know, we've got to lay aside sin that besets us and throws us down and holds us back. There are so many people I've ministered throughout this nation throughout the years that many have ran, but they've stopped running. They took their eyes off of Christ. They didn't keep saying heaven, heaven, and dear to the end, 
Seek my Lord. No, they turned aside. I know full-grown men in ministry that have turned off the ministry for other women. I know men that have pierced their souls for the love of money. I know men and women that have turned aside for the vain pleasure of just a season. But you know, the, the crown comes to that one that endures to the end. I pray that you listening will remember this simple story. Keep your eyes on Christ and run to the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for the lesson. He endured the, the shame. The, the, he endured the struggle. And he ran towards the end. He made it and resurrected. We thank you that we have a resurrected Savior, a place to run, a refuge. Father, help us to run, not by our strength, not by our might, but by the power of the Spirit as we walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of our flesh. In Jesus' name, amen.